All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Hey, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to discuss a while. Our Father's Word. Again, we're going to take this lecture just basically to talk about God's Word. And we might say that many of the questions that you've called in, I'm going to work them into a format and thereby at length answering uh, with an overall plan some of your questions, maybe with a little more in depth. We had discussed in the last lecture the world that was and the special, that documentary we just made out in the extreme western Oklahoma on the dinosaur tracks, documenting that this earth has that particular set over 300 million years. It's a long time. That branched and gapped the world that was. And our Father's word, it is written that there was an age, not as different uh, as they would be in the Hebrew, a rats or terra firma, but a different age. And we discussed how that our father at Satan's rebellion, that a third of his children, as it was documented in Revelation 12, fell off with Satan. Not too many more overcame Satan really deceived a lot of people by our Father giving those souls, which is to say being people, free will. So free will, in a sense, is, is a necessity to bring about the plan of God. Now that may sound a little confusing to you, but from the very beginning, day one, God, though he was all-knowing, wanted to create children for his pleasure that could love him. Now, it's very simple, and I don't want you to um, make it complicated. I don't want you to strain at a gnat and swallow the whole camel, all right? It's a very simple thing. God most often used human examples because humans have emotions. You know what? Your father has emotions, too, because we were made in his image just like him. Only, of course, he is supernatural and he is the creator. So he shows us those human emotions whereby we can express and understand love, pleasure, that is to say, um, good fellowship, friendship, association, mates, etc., 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 etc. So, our Father must give free will because any time that you create a being that can do nothing but love, it's not true love. Not even the supernatural can create an entity, a person, and earn its love and respect without giving that entity free will. Free will meaning they're free to do whatever they want to. They can mess up. They can fall astray, or they can refuse to love you. It can That love uh, re relationship can even turn into a hate relationship. But still, any time you create a being that must love you, it's a zombie. I love you, I love you, I love you. It has no feeling, no emotion. In other words, it's not real love because you can't buy it, you can't order it. That's why... Love is the strongest thing in the world. There's nothing stronger than love. Kings have conquered nation after nation and take the prize. And the little woman simply smile and bat her eyes and say, I love you. I would like for that to be mine. And he'd say, and what else do you need, darling? All right? Love is the strongest thing in the world. It'll conquer all. Well... It's because it is such a commodity, and perhaps if I may use that terminology, that it's precious. It is precious. So our Father wanted free will people that would love him. Now, there was, as it is written many times, I can think of, uh, of uh, Matthew chapter 13, where it concerns the tares first being planted in this world, that's to say the Kenites, sons of Cain, sons of Satan, 
It states there that certain were chosen before the foundations of this earth age. Ephesians 1, which we covered in the four pa uh, a lecture or so back. I chose you before the foundations of the earth. And I want to go to the ultimate now. I want to make that, that uh, I want to differentiate between those that were chosen and those that weren't. Because God has a purpose for it. You see, anytime you come up short, as we discussed in that last lecture, God saying, while Esau was in his mother's womb, I hated him. God doesn't hate for naught. He's a God of love and understanding. And many, many fall short. They well, God just isn't there. It's because you don't understand God's overall plan. God hated Esau because Esau was the soul of a being that was in the world that was. Not a different person. The same person. That soul, that spiritual body placed inside that little embryo, that Esau. God hated that person because of the events that transpired in the world that was. God had a right to hate him because of what he did. You might say, well, what did he do? I don't know. But the fact that my father hated him is enough for me to say, Beware, friend, for in that one we have the nation Russia today. And therefore, as we covered in the last lecture, the very first verses of Jeremiah, God said, I knew you before you were in the belly. I knew you before you even entered that embryo in your mother's womb. And I chose you even at that time as a prophet. Well, again, God is fair. God's not the author of confusion, but peace. That's to say peace of mind. So let us exercise our minds a moment and see if we can come up with a rational conclusion. If God picked Jeremiah as a prophet before he was in the mother's womb, that's to say while he was still with him, it was because in that world it was, he, he proved himself as a prophet. He proved himself to be worthy to take forth that word of God. God knew he could count on him. God knew he wouldn't run at the first little opposition. God knew that he wasn't a White House lily that the first little hot wind that hit him, he'd turn his heels up. God likes men and women of God that have got enough backbone that they can stand up and let this world see what a real Christian looks like. <laughs> Not too many do. He proved himself in that first cosmos, the first world age. And again, I want to reiterate, because there are a lot of people that evidently are not, that do not understand the terminology reincarnation. And they say, you're teaching reincarnation, and you show your ignorance concerning terminology when you say that. Because reincarnation is to live in the flesh more than one time. I'm talking about people living in angelic bodies in an age that was. The Bible states that very clearly. It's just that people will not study our Father's Word. But we've been passing through this earth age. God is totally fair. So let me tell you something, friend. When you look around yourself today and wonder, I wonder how I was born into the situation I was. You had it coming. If it was with blessings, then blessings ye deserved. If it was in poverty, poverty you deserved because of what you accomplished in the world that was. Now, in this earth age, though, any man, woman, or child has free will or election, but can after Messiah, and this being part of God's plan, having paid the price on the cross, opened the way to salvation, and through salvation, God's blessings that can raise you to whatever state, rank, or however you wish to look at it in your mind to understand it. If you serve God and do His will, He's going to raise your place. He's going to pour blessings on you. It's His promise. Many might say, well, I've gone to church all my life, and he's never blessed me. Well, what did they teach? The rapture theory in that place? A falsehood? Something that is not even written in God's Word? 
<laughs> How can you expect your tithe to be honored and bring blessings on you when you're helping Satan's work? For all those that expect a rapture will worship Satan as Antichrist before this earth age ends inasmuch as this is the final generation. God will not bless those that bless Satan. God blesses those that bless him. It is written in the epistles of, of uh, John that if you as much as wish them God's speed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. So, it just takes a little understanding of our Father's overall plan and to find yourself and to know that you have a purpose and a destiny and many of you have known it all your life that there was more to God's word than you were being taught. And you know it. I don't have to tell you. You've known it since you were a child, a lot of you. I'm going to pick up in Revelation chapter 17 when that old whore is already on this earth. You know who that old whore is? It's the churches that Satan has already round that beautiful archangel, that cherubim, that has them all bowing and scraping at his feet, bringing in plenty and prosperity to this earth age, and they think it's Jesus. And then they load on that old heifer's back and say, We're not a widow. Jesus has returned and we're married. Uh, and they're nothing but that old mystery babble and the great whore because they listen to the traditions of man rather than studying God's word. Now listen to me and you listen to me closely. You must look at both ends of the spectrum. There is on this end of that spectrum election. There is on this end of that spectrum free will. Why? Because some overcame in the world that was, and God elected them. God chose them. He sends them to this earth age, the remnant all down through the years, but the election for this final generation, whereby they will stand and he will intercede in their lives. He will place them where they thought perhaps they would never even be. Or what am I doing in this place? documentation, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 27, you don't even know what to pray for at stake. Therefore, God intercedes in your life because you were preordained. Document it. All right, let's, let's take the old heifer here, the whore chapter 17 of Revelation, where they, the old mystery Babylon is at her point. Listen to this, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, he was old Lucifer back in the world that was the king of Tyre, if you want to be more specific, Ezekiel chapter 28, and is not, he's not walking on this earth today, he's behind Christ, because Christ said, get behind me and stay there. And that's where he is until Michael throws him out on this earth very soon as Antichrist. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, that's his place. In other words, where the smoke comes out with the locust army, his little Kenite sons on this earth, Revelation 9, and go into perdition. He is the only. Do you know what the word perdition means? It means to totally perish, death forevermore, eternal. God has only passed that sentence upon one entity. Therefore, it's not difficult to understand who the son of perdition is. Because God has only sentenced one to that place. Don't let your little traditions concerning Judas get in your way. I just, I just completed a lecture on the son of perdition, I don't know, a week or so, or maybe the last one. It's, and maybe not even be. Yeah, it's ready. And if you haven't heard it, you should. It's Satan, all right? The son of perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Wonder at what? Wonder after, the whole, after him? Wonder, as it is stated, mystery, Babylon, the great mother of the harlots, an abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Well, the whole world's going to wonder after her, with the exception of a group, listen to it, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. 
those that God had not chosen before the foundation of this cosmos, this earth age. That is the election. That is to say, they stood against Satan in the world that was, and they're going to very soon when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. You know why? They had God's seal in their forehead, which is simply to say his word, his truth. They were skilled in using that word. That word is what brings you blessings, understanding it, and serving. So you see, Jesus would be a very unfair. He let all of them whore after that one, except those that he chose before the foundations of this earth. It's because they believed a lie. They wanted to be deceived because they listened to men. They listened to the damnable rapture theory. And Jesus makes it very clear. You know, I intended to bring, excuse me, I'm, I may go off camera here just a second. I intended to bring a certain book tonight, and I don't see it on my desk. Here it is. I want to read something to you. You've heard me talk about this book, The Incredible Cover-Up, by Dave McPherson many times. And you've heard me state when Margaret MacDonald, you know what the year is? It's 1830, and friend, this, can, this is documented. She got the rapture theory in a bad dream, with a bad night when she was a sick woman, mentally. You understand? I want you to know what you're believing when you believe these men on something that isn't, the word rapture is not even in the word of God. I want you to hear from Margaret's own mouth. And I read from page 37, about paragraph 3. There are two astonishing admissions in this paragraph. Uh, Margaret MacDonald saw a two-stage coming. That is to say, a rapture, and then Christ returning in Revelation 11. And that this was the first time such a distinction was made. Immediately after this amazing paragraph are these words. She writes, in other words, this is from her mouth. I felt this needed to be revealed. She had a little mental problem, you understand? She just had to, it wasn't written in God's word. She saw a vision and decided it should be revealed and that there was a great darkness, an arrow about it. In other words, it was Satan. Satan is darkness. But suddenly, what it was burst upon me with a glorious light. Satan is that bright, luminous star. That's what Lucifer means, is bright star. By her own mouth, it was darkness and evil, an error, a mistake. She knew it, that little bit of Christianity that was in that sick girl's mind. Two of the pastors of the local area were there as people came in wagons and with wagons and horses for miles around because this, uh, this family was babbling and spewing forth words uh, that were strange. And these two pastors decided they would make a great discovery from the Word of God, and they invented the rapture theory. Now, God's elect know better than to believe the rapture theory, because it is not written in our Father's Word. You are told in Mark 13, Jesus, uh, in Matthew 24, when Jesus said, was asked by the disciples, tell us how it's going to be when you return for the church, and he said, many are going to come claiming to be Christ, that's to say Christians, but don't you believe them, because they just think they're Christians. See that you're not deceived, for they will cause you to be delivered up before the, the synagogues of Satan, but you're delivered up there for a purpose, not to premeditate what you will say beforehand, but speak that that the Holy Spirit puts in your mouth. That is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2, verse 7, a language that went out in all languages for a purpose, not to, not to babble. There's enough babbling in the world today, but to take the real true gospel 
the fact that people are deceived to the whole world for a purpose, because God is fair and just. He intends to let them know the truth, even as they wallow as that Jezebel whoring in that bed with Satan. He said, Behold, I have foretold you all things, and if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. But for their sake I have shortened the time. That isn't the only place that you are warned of that first tribulation all through the book of Daniel, time after time, in the ninth chapter. He will come in seventh chapter. He will come in prosperously and peacefully. He's not coming in to destroy or to kill flesh, but to destroy and kill souls, uh, if you allow him to. So, we see then that God, as we read in that book of Revelation, he chose some before the beginning of this earth. They're not going to be deceived. The others have free will. And with that free will, they have the privilege and the opportunity of making their own mind up as to whether they will follow God or whether they will follow Satan. Does that mean they're all going to hell? They're going to think they are. But that's not the teachings of God, for we have the millennium age whereby God's elect again will teach through that millennium age. Now let's talk about election and let's talk about free will. What's the difference? There's no difference whatsoever unless you were to put it in this, this uh, perspective. One overcame in the cosmos that was. Others will overcome in this earth age. Many of your grandparents, mothers, fathers that have gone on with him, loving Jesus, respecting him, they were never confronted by the Antichrist, uh, that is to say, as he sits in Jerusalem claiming to be Christ. Therefore, they have overcome. But the difference is, and the reason I state that the full one-third of the souls that worship Satan in the world that was are living right now because they're going to, they will all do it again, a second time. Because their names were not written in the world that was? No, because they're stupid. They're a little slow up here. They will listen to what the masses say rather than what God's Word says. I feel in a sense that God is doing this to say, okay, friend, you claim that Satan, in all his wisdom, and your wisdom, deceived you. And I put you on earth, born innocent of woman, with all those things erased from your mind. I call to remembrance some things in my elect's sake, for the elect's sake. And all on your own, you've stumbled right back into the same mess. And many of them will be so ashamed that they will pray for the mountains to fall on them, which is to say they want their soul to die, but death will flee from them because you cannot wish your soul to die. There is only one that can destroy your soul, and that's Almighty God, for he created it. The flesh, hey, that's no problem. But the soul, that's a different story. So. What about this spectrum then that I forementioned? Give me some examples, you might say. Well, let me give you, as far as the elect is concerned, old Paul. Paul's free will was to murder Christians. Paul, on that road to Damascus, had a written bill in his pocket to drag out of churches Christians and murder them or deliver them to Jerusalem. And God struck him down. Did they have a revival? Did they have a big tent gathering? Brother Paul, do you love Jesus? Son? Brother Paul, will you please follow Jesus? No, Paul didn't have a choice. He struck him down on that road to Damascus, blinded him, and called him to service, the same as he does many of you today. Not that dramatic, but you still, when you hear the truth, of God's Word, you know you must go. You must follow. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
the same as it was with Paul. And Paul was delivered then, taught. And Jesus stated in that book of Acts, in chapter, what is it, chapter 10, what is it about, verse 15, states there, He is my chosen vessel, meaning he is my elect. What about the disciples? Did Jesus go up to each one of them and say, Oh, dear Simon, I am the Lord Messiah, I am the Son of God, and I have come to this earth to bring the gospel, and I'm having a revival here, and I wonder if you could follow me. He didn't say that. He didn't give him any choice. He said, follow me. It was an order. That's election. Because it was predetermined from the world that was God not being unfair. For as it is written in Romans chapter 8, you overcame in the world that was, you were predestined, you were justified, it states in the English, in the Greek it is judged. Their judgment took place there because they overcame, they stood against Satan. Now, let's take some with free will then, give us some examples, okay? Let's take the eunuch. That poor eunuch had the word of God and he was up in this carriage, he was a good man, he was trying, he was deciphering, the Holy Spirit wasn't touching him, and along comes Philip. And Philip was instructed to stop. And the eunuch says, how can I learn except some man teach me? And let's take Cornelius. Did God strike Cornelius down and say, Cornelius, you are my chosen vessel, you will follow me? No. Cornelius uh, was led by the Spirit to send for Peter. And Peter came and taught him and led him. Cornelius had free will. The eunuch had free will. The majority of people have free will. You can do whatever you want to with it. But there are certain. As it is written in Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 11, God said, or through Paul, has God forsaken Israel? God forbid, Paul said, for I myself am an Israelite, the stock of Abraham, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, I have Benjamin. My blood is of Benjamin. Do you not remember back in old Elijah's day when he thought he was the only one left when he could see the truth written in God's word and no one else seemed to understand? And God said, don't worry. I have set aside 7,000 that will never bow a knee to Baal, which is to say Antichrist. And then he goes on, it has nothing to do with grace in this earth age because they were predestined. The election have obtained the promise, and the rest are blinded. Whereby even the Gentile, the ethnos uh, in the Greek tongue, the ethnic peoples, can have an opportunity to be converted and to love Jesus and be grafted into the family of God, all of God's children, through salvation. So you see, we have free will, and we have election, and you know something? God is fair. But if you do not understand the world that was, there's no way you can see how that God is fair. Okay, I want to document something one step further. The large deception of the end times will be, will be, the coming of Antichrist. Do you know another place Paul taught that? And some of you as elect are going to teach this same thing. I want you to see the scriptures. I've asked that they be placed on your screen. Chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Paul has stated in verse 1, though it's translated, I, I uh, bear with me my, my folly. What he's really saying in the Greek is I have something real serious I want to talk to you about. And he states to this his family, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Yes, God is jealous of his children. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, Greek is very specific. The subject here is that you keep your virginity until the true Christ returns to this earth. There's a great wedding feast, but there's going to be a false wedding before that. He says, I'm afraid 
after having promised you to one husband, verse 3, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent, that is Satan, well documented. Oh, which, which chapter would you like out of Revelation? Chapter 20 or chapter 12? Let's take chapter 12, verse 7, verse 8. That old serpent, the dragon, the devil, Lucifer, whatever name you want to call him, friend, he's the same entity playing different roles. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Do you know what this word beguiled is in the Greek? Holy seduce. You got the picture? She lost her virginity. Holy seduce. That's the subject. I'm not being graphic. I'm being plain so that you get the message. He's telling you what happened in the garden. The serpent was means upright. It was Satan himself, the very appearance as of those angels that had intercourse with woman in Genesis 6, and giants were born. That brought about the flood. You understand what we're talking about? I think you do. Who beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You can't seem to stick to plain common sense and the simplicity in which Christ teaches things. You have to get on one of these flyaway things. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, if he preaches one that flies you away before the true Christ that does not come until the last trump, and when the two witnesses rise from the streets of Jerusalem, whom ye have, we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which, we, uh, which uh, ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. In other words, you swallow it hook, line, and sinker. That's what he's saying. You want to be deceived. You want an easy way out. And then he tells them why he wants them to remain virgins. Verse 13. Is that what we've got up? Yes. 13. Same chapter. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming. Just hold it right there. That word can in no way be translated transforming. It's coming disguised as, coming disguise, disguising themselves into the apostles of Christ. They claim to be super preachers. They claim to be ministers of Christ. But they teach a far different message. They teach this message that Satan put on the lips of Margaret MacDonald in 1830, just a little over 150 years ago. And it has risen with such great power in the so-called Christian churches throughout this nation that 95% espouse this same theory that came from this sick-minded woman rather than waiting for the true Christ. They believe the false apostles. Listen carefully, 14. Paul says, get ready. And no marvel. Hey, that's no step for a stepper. No marvel at all. For Satan himself, is that difficult to understand? Satan himself is transformed, you know better now, disguised into an angel of light. Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, the spurious Messiah. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his little old false preachers since Margaret MacDonald and even before that teach the rapture theory also be transformed or disguised as the ministers of righteousness and they are going to righteous you, unrighteous you right into hell whose end shall be according to their works. If you work for Satan, your end will be with Satan. Well, bless your hearts. You got free will? Are you God's elect? It doesn't make a whole lot of difference because you're God's children. But some of you that have known you had a destiny, and if you can understand my words, and if you know Satan is coming first with that big lie, I'm going to rapture you out. Then you are one of God's elect. For God blinded all others, whereby when they commit the sin in ignorance, there is no sin. And they will be taught 
in the millennium. Praise God for that. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll be praying about it. I don't know what we'll do in the next lecture. We may take this a step or two further, based overall on questions we have received. Bless your heart, you miss in a moment, please. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folks that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, My little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love. And we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back. There's your 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. And in this great state of Arkansas, 787-6026. You got a question? You got a thought? Share it with the old pastor. Pass it on up. Once you do that, those of you in Canada may use the 501 area uh, code. And uh, it seems we've been hearing from a lot of you in the Bahamas. And up in Canada, we just say, thank God for you. Okay, Gene from Pennsylvania, a prayer. All right. All right. Fathers, he knows your needs. Set a Stephen from California. Okay, bless you. Marshall from Oregon. Agnes from Wyoming. Okay. All right. And Gene from Florida. Um, Pedro from California. James from California, Karen from Washington. All right, Father is able. Jack, thank you, Jack. God is able. Hermano from California. Okay, good luck there. You don't need luck when you've got Christ. Carol, all right. From West Virginia, Glenda. Okay, Glenda from Florida. Stephanie from California, and Barbara from Georgia, okay? Now, as you know, many people call a miracle that, that God does. I, I, don't, I really hope you don't. He's your father. He's your nearest living relative. He created your soul. He created your spiritual body. Your flesh father, honor and respect him, but he only brought forth this chunk of meat that we're going to shed like a snake sheds its skin, all right? Your true father, indeed, the living God, he loves you. He promised, you ask, and I'll touch you. That's all it is. Not a miracle. It's a touch from your father. Father, we ask and we claim those promises. Lead these children, guide, direct. Touch, he in Jesus, uh, precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Bless your hearts. He's sure good to us. Okay, Jeremy from California. Pastor Murray, could you possibly do a special on the Bible itself concerning such topics as 
how the books were chosen, the Masara, the Apocrypha, I would find this very helpful in love and respect. Well, uh, why not? We, we'll do that. Uh, Donald from Pennsylvania, what do you think of the rapture? I think I answered that already, Donald. I believe the church will be caught up in the air, and if that's the rapture, then I believe it. Well, Donald, have a good trip, all right? Have a good trip. Even Danny from California, what is your opinion on the caucus? The thought of this man running for president upsets me greatly. He doesn't want prayer in public schools, and he has made it known that he is against the contra aid. Oh, my. Well, even Danny, I'm not allowed to take part in, or give advice concerning a partisan or concerning partisan politics but um, um, I can understand looks to me like uh, I can see your point there though certainly but I can make no statement concerning it you understand uh, should we have seven lamps with oh, no, no have you ever seen a menorah I want you to get your dictionary and look up a menorah that's what it is but that's spiritual all right that's strictly spiritual listen to Zechariah chapter 4 all over again bless you and thank you you know there was a case one time down here in Arkansas where the board was trying to decide who they would elect in as top preacher one of these preachers hadn't been in this nation but only a couple of generations and he hadn't been in America long enough to even be a good American because he still loved communists he loved Socialism. He didn't consider someone, say, like the Sandinistas as an enemy. He hadn't been in this country long enough to be a good American, much less a top preacher in America. So they voted him out. Okay, Arthur from West Virginia. When you are, when when we are all born into this, into the world, into the flesh, then your name is immediately written in the Lamb's Book of Life and blot it out when you die if you have not received Christ. Our pastor told me this. What do you think? Audrey, I want you to remember. Make a note. Revelation chapter 17, remember, verse 8. I read it this evening. Go back and read it again. You'll find that God's elect were written in there before the foundation of this earth. And that's not when they were born, all right? You understand? He's throwing you the curve. I'd watch him very close. Francis from California. I have a copy of the 1611 Nelson King James uh, putting notes uh, to the reader in my computer. These notes are in modern English and translation. We'll be sending several pages for translation. If interested, we'll send the rest. Francis, God bless you. We're a little bit behind and understaffed right now, and I have Several have been requesting this. You keep popping, all right? You get cracking. And as much as God has laid it on to you, this, to you to do this, you do it, and you get it to us as soon as you can, okay? It's appreciated. Bless you. Michael, from, in case you don't know what she's talking about, this is the um, letter that the translators of the King James wrote to you, the people that would read it. It's been dropped by the wayside. So this is a very important thing. Michael from Texas, Isaiah 66, verse 3. What does this mean? It means that God will not accept sacrifices of people that sacrifice them to idols or that are idol worshipers because they're not sacrificing them to him, whether it's men, children, animals, or whatever. They're sacrificing them to a false god. <clears throat> Excuse me. It falls right in line with what we've been talking about tonight. They think they're serving God, but they're deceived and they worship that bright angel, Satan. Daniel from, what is that, California or Colorado? I'm going to say Colorado, perhaps. Uh, I had a prayer request for a job, and I got one, and we'll begin tithing again. Well, God bless you, Dan. That's why we are supported by tithes and offerings. We don't have to spend the whole program asking for money. The only time you'll ever hear me mention is in the last minute because we are supported by tithes and you don't have to ask for money. It's students of God that do that. Chuck from Mississippi. And, and I praise God for answering your prayer. Let's give him the praise. Uh, Chuck from Mississippi. In Hebrew 11, it talks about Enoch. 
and the old patriarchs. Later it says they all died, receiving not the promise. But in Genesis it didn't say Enoch died. Does Hebrews prove that Enoch died? Oh, now come on, Chuck. You go back and you read that fifth verse in chapter 11. Read it all over again. And you'll find right there it says what happened to Enoch. Enoch was translated. You can't be translated and die, you know, at the same time. It was talking about all of them except Enoch. Because when it states in that fifth verse that he was translated, he was not among them to die. Okay? Come on. Martha from Tennessee. Someone asked if there was any sin that would send a person to hell after accepting Jesus, and you said yes, a sin against the Holy Ghost. Well, God's people won't sin against the Holy Ghost. What do you think about Romans 8, 37 and 39? Thank you. Well, I think it's wonderful. But Martha, you might have one great big problem. It's only written to God's elect, those that are preordained, those that are written in the... Remember, that's Romans 8 I was quoting earlier when he said, My saints, my set-aside ones, who will charge anything to my elect's sake? Are you one of God's elect? It sounds to me like you're trying to be a little argumentative with me. If you don't understand my teaching, well, um, I think that I love Romans 8:37 and 39. It's beautiful scripture. But you see, you're misquoting me. I didn't say to sin against the Holy Spirit. I said to participate in the unforgivable sin, which in part was denying the Holy Spirit to speak through you to take his gospel to the world. Don't misquote me, okay? You hear what I say, not what you think I hear. Karen from West Virginia. The song all fly away. Does this refer to the rapture theory? It sure does. They're singing their little old lullaby right to Satan, all right? And they do it in ignorance, so God bless them. They're, I love them, all right? They're my brothers and they're my sisters. And many of them, believe it or not, study with me and still believe the rapture theory because they like to hear a good Bible teacher because they know I love them and I sing them, sure I do and I don't do it for honoriness I do it because I'm concerned for their souls All right. Um, and the second part of your question it isn't written in God's word so I'm not even going to try to answer it okay, Linda from Texas since the elect will be teaching in the millennium and to those who did not learn in the flesh body when they are no longer in the flesh body, will they have any remembrance of anything that might, they might have learned in the flesh? Yes, but Linda, at the same time, they, they will know that. But when, they, when you change from this flesh body into the spiritual body, which it, which it happens instantly, to be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord whether you're good, bad, or in between. You still go there for judgment. Your health in paradise till judgment day or the millennium, whichever the case is. But when you come into that angelic body, a human being in flesh can only use about 9 or 10% of the gray matter because the rest is blocked. That's why God says to one of his elect, I call this to your remembrance. You ever wondered about that? You ever wondered why... That sounds like common sense. It should. You had it there all the time, and God just uncovered it. That's why it certainly made sense. That's why it was so easy. All will be made to their remembrance at that time. They'll be a lot easier to teach than they are today. Jerry from Kentucky. Why, if you said God is all-knowing, doesn't he know if those people with free will will follow him or Satan? Boy, Jerry, you're being a tough nut on this. I think this is the third time I've tried to go through this with you. I'm going to put it in this way. God is very intelligent. All wisdom comes from him. And as I described free will earlier in this lecture, the reason God gives that free will means they may practice their own will. If he knew what their decision would be, he could have burned them all in the world it was, and we wouldn't have to have gone through this. But you see, all-knowing means the, God has enough intelligence to know that no entity can pre-tell what someone given total and complete, hands-off free will will do. That is wisdom, is to know that fact. That is all-knowing. All right? 
Look at the people today. Do you know what they're going to do? Don't expect our father to either, or he would be putting hands on and interfering in their lives. No, if God had known in the world it was, who all would overcome and not? He would not have put us through this flesh age. We would have gone instantly from that world that was into the eternity, minus many souls. But God loves his children. He doesn't want to destroy them. He is hoping that they will come home, away from Vermont. I have friends that call me and told me they have a ghost in their house and ask me what to do. They are not Christians. What do you suggest? Well, wait, I can't really. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember your name and relationship to how much knowledge you have concerning our Father's Word. You can go there if you're brave, if you know, if you understand Luke chapter 10, where Christ said, I beheld Satan as a star fall upon the earth, and I give you power over all your enemies. If you're strong enough to know that a Christian one of God's elect, when the plowing is too rough for everybody else, that's just the way we like it. March in there, anoint that house, and order anything evil out of it. You don't have to even do it out loud with them non-Christians. Clean the thing for them. But I'll tell you something, if they're truly not Christians and you go off and leave it empty, empty means without Christ, there'll be seven times more come back on them. So be sure and talk to them. Let the miracle take place, and perhaps within this it will convert them, make believers. You can control it, all right? Take charge. Be a can-do type person. That's what God's elect are. Why are we can-do type people? Because God gives us the strength, the knowledge, and the ability. Mike from Nebraska. I'm getting a Bible burnout. Could you take a week or so out and teach on the incredible cover-up or the stone of destiny or something? I know what the little knob on the TV is for, and I'm not being smart, but I'm, I'm head over heels for your teaching. I'm just tired. Well, maybe the last couple of days has given you a break, okay? I understand. Just absorb what you can. Don't, don't, just, I know we transmit 24 hours a day. But just study what you can absorb and stop. Josephine from California. When Jesus became sin on the cross, the Father kept his soul pure so that we would have salvation through him. Is this correct? Well, in a way it is, but you're flirting dangerously close with the fact that he became sin. He didn't. See, he was a sacrifice. And a sacrifice must be perfect, spotless. He was. Had he taken on the sin, even in the flesh, it's just that he paid the price for it. I think a lot of this comes from his words on the cross, Ila Ila la Masha which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And people would say, God forsook him. He didn't. Jesus was quoting Psalms 22, and wise people go there and read the Psalms he quoted on the cross, whereby they received the message he intended for them. And and on the rest of your question, let's see, start out, a Masa, I, I don't know if you're a Hebrew scholar or not. You don't tell me this, see? And, and if I recommend books that you have to be a Hebrew scholar before you can read them yourself, you say, in other words, you're handicapping me. If you're only an English reader, stick with the Strongs. And probably the Greek and, and the Hebrew, and, and with most of the New Testament having been written in the Greek in the first place, okay? Luke was a Greek scholar. Then you stick to the Strongs. It'll teach you both languages. Lisa from California. My 11-year-old son is having bad dreams. And if it, is it Satan bothering him? I have anointed the house and him. How can I show him not to be afraid? Is it all right to re on it? It is, but... If this sounds to me like a lack, be sure. Question him about some of his friends. Have they threatened him? Is somebody bothering the boy? I want you to go deeper into his mind as to what's bringing this fear. Tell him you love him and he can talk to you about anything. My dear, I think that, I think that something is missing as far as you having all the knowledge of what this is that's bothering him. I, I don't think it's anything demonic after you having anointed the house. I think one of his little friends has threatened him if he doesn't do this or that or something else, and I think you need to 
be very wise, okay? And B from California, I just love you and the teaching. Well, thank you, B. How do I know if God expects me to be a part of the Shepherd's Chapel? Well, if you hear it and you enjoy it, surely he does. And if he approves you, we're sure going to. You're, you're, you're here. I was sprinkled. Should I be baptized by being submerged? I never advise any. Baptism is a very personal thing between an individual and our Savior. I never advise one. It's according to how you feel about it. Jesus was submerged. He went all the way under and came up. I, that's the only way I will do it, and I feel he set the example. All right, and well, bless your hearts. Um, I, I, I love you all. I'm out of time. Again, we are brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. Don't forget, this month we're having to replace some equipment. I mean, you're doing real good. I, I would say that we've got well a third. I don't need donations earmarked for the new transmitter or anything like that. I, I think that's getting along real good. Those of you now that you've studied with us, you're being fed from this table. Um, why don't you bless God and let him bless you? Once you do that, we only have one transmitter. If one little tube goes out, you cannot go to the hardware and grab it and buy one. Okay, we have to have a standby. The most important thing, stay in God's word. Every day and it's a beautiful day. Jesus is the living word.